Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have a really wonderful guest that I've wanted to have on the show for a long time. But before I introduce her, I just want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, Rex MD. Um, they are a place where you can get generic and branded Viagra very easily. Everything's online, even the prescription, and they deliver straight to your door. No office visits, no talking to a receptionist. Super simple. Go to rexmd.com slash holly to get started with a sample pack of prescription generic Viagra today. All right, um, let's introduce the producer, director, and entrepreneur. She is discovering a new approach to sexuality in cinema. She is the co-founder of Lustry, where real-life couples share their sex lives with the world. She also recently, and this is super interesting, directed the first publicly funded German porn. Let's welcome Palita Papal. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Hi, it was so a pleasure to um, pleasure to finally get to make this happen. Like I've mentioned before, we started filming. I've I've wanted to have you on for a long time. I've followed you on Twitter. You've written some really brilliant things about the adult industry. Um, I know you're a big advocate for sex worker rights and just sex work in general, and um, you're just somebody who comes off like really intelligent and connected to our industry and somebody who I think is an important voice. So I was like, why did it take me so long to ask her to come on? But here we are. Oh my God, stop it. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much. I, I, I love obviously everything you do. And um, yeah, and I'm just so honored to be here and to be talking to you. It's great. Thank oh you. my gosh, thank you. Um, so I guess let's start, you know, at the beginning, I like to get everybody's origin story. How did you actually get started in the adult industry? So I was always fascinated by porn, but more like by the idea of it and that what it felt was like a safe environment to actually explore my own sexuality rather than like, I don't know, a loving relationship, which was never, never felt so interesting. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, but I always was conflicted because I thought also like, oh, porn is the tools of the patriarchy to exploit women. So, you know, with all of that mess, uh, messy conflict in myself uh, as a teenager, after I finished school, I moved to Berlin. I grew up originally in Spain, so I moved to Berlin. That is a way more, um, yeah, just open, sexually open city, I would say. And then here, finally, I met queer feminist women that were doing porn as part of their art and their practice, um, you know, to express their sexuality, to explore it, to great visibility for, for their sexualities and bodies. And that just felt really right to me. Um, so I started performing with them in like literally no budget films for no money. <laughs> <laughs> you just did it because it felt like something you were interested in doing. Yeah, it felt like it, was, it really felt like the right thing to do. I was completely, I was fascinated by the idea of performing in a porn. And um, even if I couldn't, you know, I mean, now I can look back at it and say, um, as I was saying, like, I think it just felt like a space uh, where sexuality could take place free from all of these other um, restrictions that we grow up thinking should be in, like needs to be because of love, especially if you grow up as a woman, right? Like you have sex because you're in love or because you want to get pregnant or because like, I don't know, a number of reasons that um, just not because you just want to have sex, <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. that's, because then you're a slut. Um, right, so I grew right. Up you know, so I grew up being a slut um, in my school. Um, you know, I was I was interested in a lot of people of different genders, of different ages of, you know, I was interested in more than one person at the same time. And I just, um, yeah, and I had a lot of trouble with that because people wouldn't appreciate my likings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. just por porn and the porn industry or, or just porn maybe as a start, because I was a little bit scared of the, the porn industry at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But just porn felt like a space to be myself and to explore my sexuality and have sex with different people without being judged. I mean, being judged for doing porn, you know, from people outside of the industry, but a place where I could encounter other people that felt like minded and I could explore that sexuality with them in that in that space. Yeah, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, so did did you come into this, you know, first experience with a certain idea of what porn was? And then did you come out of it thinking something totally different? Um, 
In a way, yes. Um, I think it, it's maybe not like from one day to another. It was like more like mm. a longer process, but I definitely like, I mean, I arrived at my first porn shoot thinking, um, you know, that what I was doing was, <laughs> it, I, I, I knew it was going to be liberating and it was, I knew it was going to feel right and it felt amazing, <laughs> but I did start doing porn thinking that I was doing something that was better, you know, because I, I did believe, oh, there is porn out there that is bad uh, and where women are exploited and I'm doing a different kind of porn, um, you know, with different values. And I'm, I mean, I'm ashamed to say this almost out loud now, but I think it's important because there are still so many people thinking that out there, right? And I understand where they're coming from because that, this is what we get fed, like all the media and like everything. I mean, you know, I don't need to tell you, but um, we get this idea and I came with this idea and then I started doing porn. I understood that so many things that I have that I have thought that I have been fed about what it means and how it feels and like everything around doing porn were wrong. And then I finally start meeting people from the, you know, so-called mainstream industry. I mean, just whatever. Um, and, you know, and that completely blew my mind because that was the last bit uh, of, of me like deconstructing the, all this, all this, yeah, stupid prejudice that I had um, and, and, and becoming solidarity with the, with the full sex work industry. It's so interesting that you say that because I literally experienced that last night. I got sent a summary from somebody who's young um, and it was about like kind of the history of the porn industry, the internet and, um, you know, how it's changing or how certain uh, projects I'm working on might change it. Anyways, uh, and the things that she wrote about the adult industry were you know, she pulled from like The Guardian, which is like a very anti-porn publication from that New York Times Christoph article. Yeah. I mean, like all, all of this. And it was just like, she was like, so porn ruins relationships and it creates desensitization. And, you know, like she was literally echoing all of this anti-porn propaganda that, you know, is fed to the mainstream media. And like, you know, to be fair, like she didn't know, um, she's has no experience in the adult industry. She just literally goes on Google and like, she reads like the first things that come up in the search term. And I was just like, no, 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 no. Um, so it was just, but it, it made me realize I'm like, this is what most people think. And this is literally like why I do my podcast and why I have people like you on because, you know, once again, always want to say, of course, there's dark and bad corners of our industry. Like there is with every industry, there's bad producers, there's bad companies, all of those things. But like, it's, it's not this, you know, kind of horrible place where women just get sucked in and spit out and everyone's exploited. Nobody wants to be there and it's ruining people's lives. And we know it's ruining people's lives, but we don't care. It's just like, Oh man, I was just, but I was just reading this going, fuck. It's amazing though, that people like have this idea or fed this idea that this is how the industry looks like. And they, at the same time, they, you know, they hear like, it's a, you know, billions or whatever, like huge industry. And that they think that they actually believe this is the case. You know, that they believe there is this huge industry where like so many people there and like everyone is miserable and like, and it's in all of these countries where like they're very regulated. So I'm like, I don't know, I just had, for example, a, a, a journalist also asking me something about like laws or changing here over Europe and blah, blah. And he was, I mean, I think he phrased it a bit, unfortunately, but he was saying like, oh, he heard, um, he heard in like in whatever company, like every time before a shooting, uh, they like sign contracts and record a video saying like, yes, I want to participate in blah, blah. And like, he was asking me like, if I think this is, this might be a solution for this problem. And I'm like, you literally don't think that every single porn company in the world signs contracts and has a conversation before the shootings. Like how, how, like, what do you, how do you think it works? You know what I mean? Like, like the, the porn industry is like so professional and has like such high, uh, you know, standards in terms of like creating a secure and safe environment. Again, as you're saying, of course, not every single, and I'm sure there's dark parts like in any other industry, but I'm like, actually, like if you take, you know, this is a German journalist. If you take Germany, like every single production company here in Germany, like every single one has like pretty strict standards of how these things work. And like, I, I'm mm. like, how can you even think, you know, that it, like it's, it's so, you wouldn't believe, if you would read that from any other industry, you would be like, what? It's not, it's not 
possible? Like, how is that possible? You know what I mean? I think it's so interesting. Like the things that people will just assume are, are true and not mm -hmm. question like at all. Hearing numbers, I think like yeah, 80%, anti, like, you know, all of these numbers that exactly this anti-porn propaganda, uh, you know, like run by like religious, uh, basically organizations that are putting out all of these numbers there that are not that's literally just not true. Like how people just absorb them without questioning. It's, it's amazing to me sometimes people that, you know, there are journalists that are like trained to actually fact check things and, and question stuff. And just when it comes to sexuality slash porn, just like every, like every common sense suddenly it's like goes out the window. <laughs> it's just like, it's, yeah, it's interesting too. You know, I interviewed a neuros, uh, neurologist, Dr. Nicole Prousey, and she was talking about things that I hadn't actually considered in, uh, so how difficult it is to do like accurate tests and surveys when it comes to the adult industry because of like the ethics board that they have to follow. So this whole, you know, um, this whole like idea that she was talking about like, you know, the, the issue of like kids watching porn, right? which obviously is a problem. Nobody wants minors to watch porn, but, you know, uh, throwing around that it creates like, um, you know, all of these addiction issues and all of this trauma and all this stuff. And she was saying, well, the problem is, is that you can't really study that in an accurate way because you can't show children porn and then measure their reactions. Like you can't do that. So like already, like you're, you don't really have a sample group to come to, to go to. And then she was talking about, you know, other situations where it says that like, you know, causes ED and desensitization in men and stuff like that. She's like, the problem is, is that like most of that information comes from people who are coming, you know, to a doctor or to a psychologist or whatnot um, to address their ED problems. Um, and she's like, so the sample group is generally taken from people who are trying to solve a problem, but the people who don't have a problem are naturally not approaching somebody to try to solve it. So you don't really get that information on them, if that makes any sense. So it was just interesting to hear how, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a hard, like porn effects on people is, is, is sort of a difficult thing to study. Yeah. And she did like a whole study of women and how women react to porn. And, um, so they like, you know, uh, put sensors on them to like measure like blood flow to the vulva and like showed them various images, um, and things like that. And she found all kinds of interesting things that women are more turned on by porn than they realize. Like they'll say they weren't turned on, but like their body's showing something different. So there was this whole interesting kind of conversation around like how women generally are not supposed to enjoy sex, definitely not supposed to enjoy porn. So even like their, their brain kind of represses the fact that they're experiencing any sort of like bodily reaction to it and how deep that goes. It was just, it was just a very interesting eye-opening conversation around how, how these statistics are arrived at and how flawed most of them are simply because of the nature of what we do is a hard thing to like study in a lab. Right. Plus, um, get funding for, you know, studying something that yeah. is not framing porn into like, what are the bad consequences of watching porn? You know, like, I, I mean, I have right. a bunch of friends working in academia and, um, do you know, it's like every time, you know, if you're, if you're trying to have a neutral, like investigation or study, um, it will just not get as easily funded or it would not be even like, you know, it would you even just be thrown upon, um, you mm -hmm. know, by colleagues and so on, unless you're framing it in the, in this light of like, how bad is it really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But mm -hmm. if you're saying like, oh, what are actually maybe the positive effects of watching pornography with your partners or whatever. That's just not mm -hmm. something that necessarily gets funded. And then plus what you were saying, I think it's so interesting. It's just, I mean, we're talking sexuality and like sexuality is something that is such big part of our lives and identities. Uh, and it's like, you also like the same way that you can obviously can't show porn to kids and see how they react, but you can also just like isolate people from like any other like audiovisual stimuli and be like, okay, this person, this is what porn did to your sexuality. It's like, how can you separate that from Hollywood movies and music and music videos and like, you know, whatever other information you're receiving about sexuality, about your body, about relationships that you're being fed from so many different sources. Like how do you, how do you isolate those sources? Right. Mm -hmm. It's tricky. And also too, she was talking about, you know, she's like really what they're, what the problem is generally with people who watch too much porn, because the term addiction is not 
like really acknowledged by like the American Psychology Association as an, as it doesn't technically fall into the parameters of what an addiction would be, but what it could be is like an unhealthy compulsive behavior. But you know, what else falls into that? Watching too much television, getting on your phone too much, being on social media too much, all of these things that are like actually real issues and just fall around like too much consumption of media. Um, but you don't see like a big campaign against like Netflix ruins marriages. It destroys people's sex lives. Kids are watching too much TV and it's rotting their brains, which I mean, I think is probably true. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think we have to look at like, we, we have to look at a problem around, I think there's too much media in the world and it's too accessible to us at all times, all kinds of media. And um, it's pulling us away from our day-to-day -day lives and our social interactions. I think that's a problem overall. But, you know, people like to isolate it down to like, oh, it's it's and only looking at the porn aspect of it when yeah. there's so much more to it. Uh, absolutely. And what um, what there is not enough of at the same time is proper sexual education, right? That yeah. is inclusive, that is talking about what is porn and how to consume it in a way that is healthy and that can like, you know, have a positive effect mm -hmm. on you. So and I think that's where we should also be looking at, like, what are we like, you know, if you're saying there's too much porn, which is, you know, arguably, wh where is the, the sex education that needs to go along with it so that we have, uh, you know, a healthy relationship to it? I think. It's yeah, exactly. Question. Exactly. Like what, you know, so people understand what they're looking at. They understand that it's a fantasy. They understand that it's not real life. Um, but also, too, I mean, there's different kinds of porn, right? So there's what, like, most people think of, which is like, you know, kind of maybe hardcore gonzo porn, um, you know, it's, you're having sex with your stepbrother, um, you know, things that are just like, just like on, you know, the, at the top of the list on, on tube sites, which is where, let's be honest, most people get their porn. Um, right. And, uh, you know, and then there's the cum shot on the face at the end, but there's different kinds of porn like lustry, which um, is your, uh, which is your company. So tell us a little bit about that and how is it different than from what most people would say is mainstream porn right so um last three basically i like to call it documentary porn because basically what we do is we're trying to document people's sex lives so it's a community platform where real couples and of course by real couples i mean whatever however people want to describe a relationship so we're obviously not saying like you need to be married and have a mortgage and kids <laughs> um yeah. yeah you can be a casual bdsm play partner or the only the only idea behind it is that you actually have an ongoing sexual relationship with each other in your private life so you're not just meeting for shooting a video which obviously is mm -hmm. totally fine but just in this case this this community this platform is for folks that have a relationship um going on and that want to capture they want to introduce a camera into that relationship and do videos of what they most enjoy and share them so basically there are absolutely no rules on what sexual content should be shot um and we pay folks by per video that we admit so there's not like an incentive to be doing something that you think is going to get you more likes or, or or money or sales or whatever it's uh you can do whatever you want it's literally if you want to you know have cuddle sex for half an hour because that's what that's what you do great we want to see that if you want to have a super hardcore bdsm quadruple anal session that's great because that's to be what you enjoy um and i think what's interesting about that and i mean um i started doing last three because because that's what i wanted to see i was curious i was literally i'm a voyeur and wanted to see what happens in people's bedrooms <laughs> no but i wanted to i, I wonder i was doing porn myself as a performer and in a lot of like so-called amateur porn um which again nothing against it but there are a lot of companies and people that are staging a kind of sexuality that they think is going to sell great and um and they are calling it are calling it authentic which mm. is fine I'm, I'm i have no issue with that <laughs> to be honest like you do whatever you 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 know you do um but i was because i was as a performer like doing that and it was representing a kind of sexuality that had not so much to do maybe directly with what i fancy um i was wondering okay how can you though can you actually show sex the way it would happen if you didn't have a camera in and obviously the moment you put a camera in a room there's a there is going to be a difference unless your people don't know but that would be you know unethical and illegal so <laughs> don't do right. that 
Um, so, but like my idea, like the question was like, how do we do it? How do we come as close as possible to actually capture what people do in their regular sex lives? And that's how we decided to go about it. Like being like, okay, if you have two people that have this relationship, they know each other's bodies, um, you know, they have this dialogue, this sexual dialogue going on and they just capture that. That's the closer we can get to document it. And so that's why I like to think of last year as like an archive of people's sex mm-hmm. lives and relationships. Do you, do you find that certain videos, like, do you have the data on whether or not certain videos do better than others? Like, is it an a la carte pay per view platform? Yeah, it's a membership uh, based platform. So you pay per month and you have access to the full library. And we okay. do, I mean, we do not, oh, to be honest, I shouldn't be saying this, but I mean, we do not collect as much as we should be doing. We are really, um, yeah, we're willing to to do better there, but <laughs> we do know more like after, you know, we launched last year, 2016. So now, I mean, just by like observing and getting and users, you know, reviews and stuff and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's mm, a lot of times, I think for like, I think people that are on last year, a lot of it is about, um, you know, getting, getting to know these people. Cause we always saw that every video has an introduction, right? So you get to know a little bit like who are these folks, uh, what's the relationship like? And I feel like couples or throuples, we have not only two people, but maybe three or whatever. Um, I, I feel like the videos were, where you, you know, might be staged, but I think it, where you really see like the couples are having a good time uh, and they're really enjoying themselves. And they, at the beginning, maybe they're like another, especially candid or like really feels like they're really open and excited about sharing themselves with the community. I feel like those videos do great actually. Yeah. That is, yeah. And is I something can, about that. And I can tell you definitely like from, you know, the bigger like companies, like mainstream perspective, you know, I shoot for like browsers and twisties that the performers that do the, the best really are the ones who enjoy their job. And it's, it's obvious because the, I think the fans can tell when you're faking it, it like, it just, it just comes across. Um, you know, I mean, who comes to mind and I, <laughs> kind of funny because every time I her name comes up a lot just because everybody loves her I've joked about changing the name of this podcast to everyone loves Angela White because everybody <laughs> does um but she is like someone who's very authentic like she is like I'm on set with her you know when the cameras are not rolling and she's fucking into it like she is into her partner like she is focused like she is so excited to be there like she's just she really wants to do it and I think fans really respond to those people and there's a lot of other girls that I know who are beautiful and you know, they, they're popular and they do fine, but like, it's not like they don't enjoy themselves, but like, this is, they're not, you know, as connected to their partner. They're not as like mentally involved as some of the other people are. And I, and I think that you can tell, like, I I don't know. And yeah, I think that fans really respond to performers who want, who like what they're doing. I think we all enjoy watching people who enjoy having sex. Yeah. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about Paulita's uh, publicly funded porn, which is super interesting um, and so much more. So stick around. We'll be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is like the biggest online sex toy retail store. And in fact, they don't just offer sex toys. They also have movies, they have lingerie. They basically have anything sexy that you could be looking for. Now they have an incredible offer. Get 50% off of any one item when you go to adamandeve.com. But that's not where it ends. So not only will you get 50% off any one item, They will also load up 10 free gifts for you on top of that. You will get six free movies, a free mystery pack that includes an item for him and a special toy for her and something we know you'll both enjoy, plus free shipping. Now that's a lot of free stuff, but you can only get this offer if you go to adamandeve.com and use my code HOLLY. That's adameve.com, use code HOLLY, for 50% off of any one item plus 10 free gifts. Hey guys, we're back. So Palita, tell us about your publicly funded porn movie. So this is 
so much fun, to be honest. Like I've, I've spent literally over a year now, um, every time I talk to a journalist or anyone that is interested in my work, um, I, I've been pushing this idea that I'm like, okay, the state has so many issues with porn, uh, instead of be trying it to like shutting us down and putting like a lot of like financial and political, um, you know, barriers for us to do porn, they should be funding us. Like they should, you know, if they actually think porn is that bad, they should be putting their money into, um, into our industry. And uh, we should have a conversation on what kind of porn should be produced. And I always say this, obviously as a, like as a provocative thing, like as a, you know, crazy idea. Imagine if, uh, you know, if the States would actually pay for porn. So like three weeks ago, or like I get an email from a publicity um, a broadcaster, right? And they're like, so we want to make a porn. Do you want to direct it? And I'm like, you are kidding me. <laughs> like for real? <laughs> and uh, it's basically, I mean, it was not, so it's just more of a, you know, also of a provocative uh, thing. This, this show, uh, Magazine Royale by ZDF. Um, it's uh, it's a little, I don't know, like maybe just to give you an idea of what it is, it's a bit like, you know, last week tonight with John Oliver or something and John okay. Bimmer is, yeah. the, John is the, the, the host and they're always pushing boundaries, right? They're like, um, I guess they're the, you know, the most like radical it gets in this broadcaster. Um, and they were approaching the topic of, um, well, of pornography in general and concretely on the tubes, because right now in Germany, like for the last year, there's been a very intense persecution of the of big tube platforms like Xvideos, Xhamster, Pornhub, and so on and so forth. Uh, they're basically trying to shut them down on server level, which is insane because that's what like China does, right? So very mm -hmm. problematic, all in the name of protecting the youth. So this is... Yeah, this is problematic. We can go into it if you want to get more into the politics of German politics against porn. However, this show was reporting on that and, you know, they were digging a bit deeper and understanding um, uh, why the the solution that the state is currently offering, like shutting people down, is not obviously not a solution to protect the youth. Um, and they came up with this idea of like, okay, why not? Uh, there is... We, you know, they were saying like we have an obligation towards the, um, you know, the people that fund this broadcaster through their through the money that is collected publicly, uh, of informing folks and sexuality is part of like our lives and why shouldn't we be using porn as a medium to inform people about sexuality and why you know let's give it a try, so that was a proposal which I think is, I mean I'm, I was like I'm a hundred percent in. <laughs> And uh, yeah, from there, we just started like, we didn't have so much time. I had like literally like 10 days from like the moment they wrote me to like delivering them a finished color graded. <laughs> um, Are you serious? Point. Yeah, for real. It was just really short, short notice. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, okay, I'm doing it. <laughs> Wait, why uh, did but, they give you sh short notice? Can I ask, did, is it, it, did, it wasn't because like, cause I know some people think that like, there's no pre-production that goes into porn and we just like get a hotel room and like set up a camcorder and just leave it on. Like. Is that, was that part of their thinking? Like, oh, it's just porn. It doesn't take that long to make. No, I want to, I want to take them into, like, I want to defend them. No, I don't think so. I think they just, I mean, you know, they produce one show a week. So they're just like, yeah, you know, they're like, okay, lot. this they're, is our next just, week's show. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. And I mean, it was not yeah. like next week, but like, yeah, it was like, yeah, I guess they, you know, there's, there's a lot that they're doing and they just didn't, yeah, they didn't play with so much more time. I guess maybe the idea came, you know, at that time and they were like, okay, let's do this quick. Um, but yeah, then we started that conversation. I was like, okay, so what, you know, what are we going to have in here? You want to show, you want to show safer sex? You want to show what bodies do you want to show? What, what, like, what do we want to show? And it was really interesting. I have to say, um, like in their defense as well, like they came, um, they came not having much, like any idea about how to shoot porn. So yeah, but they mm -hmm. might as well thought like it's as easy as getting out of room and, and just doing it, but they were very open to listen. Cause so I, you know, I asked them, you know, I just asked them a couple of questions and I think that clearly, you know, I was like, okay, I, like, have you contacted already someone and what, cause I was like, okay, this is so short time. I need people, like, I need to get people tested and I need to get, you know, like, blah, blah. And they were like, oh, okay. You tell us <laughs> kind of like, mm -hmm. what do you need? Like how, how, how is this done? And they were again very open to to listen to it um, and 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 try to make it happen in this short time. So um, yeah, so that was fun. <laughs> so how how did you get? So what does publicly funded mean? Like, is it tax dollars? Is it like how? What does that mean? 
Yeah. So, um, and I had to learn this because I, at some point, I think I said uh, tax paid and they were really angry about that. So I'm happy that you're asking me this question so I can uh, make it right this time. Um, so, so the, the, Okay, and I don't know exactly this because in Spain, I come originally from Spain, and in Spain we don't have this. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I believe I'm not sure. I don't. Th- I'm not sure actually if US has this kind of broadcasters or not. Basically, the idea of like a publicity fund uh, broadcasting, um, a, you know, institute or whatever instance is that it is not tax paid. It doesn't come from directly from tax money because then the state would have a lot of say in it, right? Mm-hmm. So the, right. a way of being more independent is like. It is basically money that has been collected from everyone living in this country. It's just not mm-hmm. called tax money. It's called, you know, the money that you collect for funding this public TV station. I don't okay. know what, you know, and I mean, the BBC yeah, we have works that. that way, right? You also have, yeah, it? what would it be? We have PBS. PBS is a public, okay. publicly funded station. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's what it means. So basically it means like, yeah, it's, it's, it's paid by all of us, but it's not directly depending from the state. So this, so they can remain independent in the way they, um, yeah, they report on staff, right. And take decisions. Interesting. Um, did they give you like a decent budget or was it kind of hard to work with? No, it was fine. Actually. I was like, they were like, how much is it going to cost us? And I was like this much. And they were like, okay. Okay, great. So they weren't like, they didn't give you a number. You gave them a number. Yeah. Yeah. So that and then, was fair. And yeah. Yeah. So tell I mean, us about, all- sorry, no, I was going to say, tell us about the scene, like who's in it, like what, what happens, what's the setup? So basically I asked him like, do you want to have a story? Like, do, do we want to, you know, do we want to go <laughs> feature film? No, <laughs> no time for that. <laughs> uh, but they were like, no, we just want it to look good. Like we just want it pretty. Uh, and mm-hmm. obviously we want the people in there to have a good time. And, um, yeah. And, and, and then we discussed, like, we really, we went more into the details. So basically I proposed them like a couple of performers that I love to work with. And I knew like, okay, I know this, I've been working with these performers for a lot of time and I just felt it was safe, especially with a short time and so on to mm-hmm. go with people, you know, that I, that I know I can trust and they're reliable and so on. Um, and they, they were like, yeah, great. Obviously I, I, you know, proposed, um, a cast that was, as diverse as I could make it happen in this, again, in this short time, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, a, a 10 minute porn film made in 10 days will never, you know, achieve to, to in- include everyone's bodies and sexualities, obviously, but I tried to go for a queer folk. So I had two men and two women and they were all into each other. So it was a basically bisexual foursome. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we discussed things like, okay, we, they didn't want it to go to BDS Emmy, which is a shame because some of the performers would definitely have been more kinky, but I was like, no, you have to tone it a little bit down, please, for this one. <laughs> Do whatever <laughs> you want, but just don't go too kinky. Uh, and then, yeah. you know, this class, we decided to, you know, throw in every possible or like basic safer sex, like condoms, uh, um, mental dams and gloves. Um, and we just, you know, tried to, I was like, hey, try to give me a lot of like nonverbal, unverbal communication as you're going. So like gestures, you know, heads, nods, uh, eye contact. Just give me a lot of that so we can see that everything that's happening is, you know, enthusiastically received and and, and made. Um, yeah, and then we just said like, let's not let's not have it end with a male cam shot. It's like everyone is welcome to come or not. Like whatever, there was no rule on that. But just let's not end it on a, on a male camera just because, you know, there is a lot of porn that does end like that. Mm-hmm. And we just wanted something else. And we were luckily, uh, we got squirting, which is great as well. And, um, wait, what else did we get in there? Um, yeah, we got a lot of laughing, which I always love. I think that was, yeah. that was nice. <laughs> so do you normally shoot with dental dams and gloves and condoms all the time? Or was it just for this scenario? Because it was like on public television. I leave it in most of my productions, I leave it up to the performers. So they decide mm-hmm. what, what, I mean, we obviously always do the, the regular testing, of course. Um, mm-hmm. but I leave the up to them if they want to use any further, um, safer sex barriers, um, mm-hmm. for the, f- I mean, for last three, the thing is because most of people are, you know, regular partners, like uh, most of them have other ways of like they don't use yeah. I mean, some use condoms but a lot of them don't use other stuff for right, the gang sense. banks now like um we've been using condoms in some of the gang banks uh, because some folks uh wanted to use those as a means of preventing like pregnancy uh, i have to say i don't think condoms work great with gang banks to be honest 
Uh, they're no, just not, they don't they work don't, great for porn scenes at all. Yeah, exactly. To be, yeah, that's, that's an issue. They really actually, don't, you know, no, they I don't. mean, when we, so, when we were fighting like measure B and them trying to mandate the condoms, like it was the performers who were like, I, I don't want to do, it wasn't us. It wasn't the yeah. producers being like, these don't sell. I mean, when I was shooting for wicked, they've changed things now, but wicked was a condom only company. And the performers would be like, fuck, I gotta wear a fucking con. You know what I mean? They'd be like, God, they, like they were not excited about it at all. Yeah. So, you know, there's this whole idea of like, oh, you're protecting the performers and all this kind of stuff. Well, like, of course, like most mainstream media outlets, they don't actually ask the people that this, this thing is affecting. Um, and they were like, we don't want this. So in terms of this uh, porn movie, so this was on German, like regular television, like anyone could watch it. So, of course not. <laughs> Basically, the funny thing is when they ask me, like, you know, we're going to do this, you want to direct. And I was like, you do realize that you're not allowed to do it, nor to show it anywhere. And they were like, oh, is that the case? They're like, oh, yeah, double check. That's true. Well, we're going to do this anyway. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> so basically, um, what they did is they made a, a trailer of the video. We did shoot the porn. It's out there. Mm -hmm. um, but then they, they, they edited like a trailer where they like censored everything basically with having like the face yeah. of the host. It's, it's pretty, it's hilarious actually. Um, and that's what they showed on the show. And they were like, well, there's this video out there somewhere. We can't tell you, we can't show you and we can't tell you where. Because now this, this is the real fun part if it wasn't like, the biggest shit that <laughs> that affects our industry in Germany, which is the regulations in Germany for online porn, or like just even how adults are able to access porn are ridiculous. Basically, what Germany says is minors should not have access to porn, you know, up to there, we're all on the same page. Their conclusion of that is every adult that wants to watch porn needs to identify themselves. So not just like verify their age, like other countries are saying, no, no, you need to go and be like, hello, my name is, you know, whatever, whatever, here's my, uh, here's my ID card. Um, and then you can watch porn, which is insane. Cause it's like, why, why would you have to read like, I mean, first of all, it's a huge data problem. And here in Germany, they're usually super concerned about like, who's getting your data, what, what's happening to that. Uh, but at the same time, they're telling you, oh, please give whatever corporation or platform your data so that they know exactly how many minutes of the tentacle, you know, hentai porn you watched. I mean, like what? <laughs> um, so your address and yeah, yeah. And everything about you, like what? Um, so basically every, like a, like a point, we have a similar system in Germany, like, you know, the PG 13, PG 18, whatever, basically porn doesn't get a uh, PG 18, right? It just, it's automatically just not, you just can't show it on TV just can't, mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. And you can just only show it again behind these like super, these verification or identification measures that are A, super complex, B, nobody wants to use them uh, and they're expensive as well. So if you're a small company, literally you just can't afford to have them on place. So this mm -hmm. was this was showing literally like the absurdity of the reality uh, in this country regarding porn, that the porn industry is, you know, what I was saying before, like politically, because of these super strict and unreasonable regulations, um, it's just basically preventing anyone that actually wants to do things right and and um, and distribute a porn that is you know possibly diverse and has different um, you know aesthetics and includes different whatever body sexuality sexual you know other levels to the porn that might be educational or not or whatever you just can't do that because of these regulations. So they're in the name of protecting the youth, what they're doing is they're basically encouraging everyone to go onto other platforms. that are not that, you know, if you keep it, like you end up in piracy platforms, of course, and other platforms, because just legal platforms won't, aren't allowed in Germany because they're not financially sustainable, you know, if you follow the rules. Right. So does that mean um, like a German based company? Because you were saying yeah. earlier about how they're like moving to ban, you know, to platforms like Pornhub, et cetera. I'm assuming then that people in Germany can still access those platforms. So doesn't that like completely and totally bypass the whole idea of like trying to make porn be verified 
by your age if you can just go to a different website that's not hosted in Germany? That's exactly the point. Yeah, it's completely ridiculous. And so what they're trying to do is block every site that is not based in Germany. And that's what they've been trying to fight for the last two years. Um, you know, trying to, because a lot of these big companies are now based in the European Union. Uh, they were trying to, yeah, basically get them. <laughs> I'm just going to say it short. Uh, yeah. and, and that's why now they're like, now what they're trying to do is like shut these pages down, even though they're not based in Germany. Um, which again, it's, we know this from other countries like China and Iran, you know what I mean? It, this is insane for a, for a country that calls themselves democratic and that they're going these ways instead of actually sitting down with an industry that is very much, um, you know, committed to finding solutions. As we were saying at the beginning, not only because some of us are parents ourselves or like, you know, but you know, like also other moral reasons why we do not want uh like young people, but of course not children watching our porn content. Um, also, it's just not financially like these people don't, don't have credit cards and can't pay for it. So we like, there's absolutely right. no interest from our industry to be making mm -hmm. our content accessible to minors. So um, if we would sit mm -hmm. down and have a conversation on what actually technologies might be reasonable, such as maybe filters, <laughs> you know, or, um, or there, you know, other, other parental controls and like how we could be educating parents on to use those filters and how like all of our industry is voluntarily already adhering to these filters, like RTA label and such, uh, you know, such technologies that have been in place and that are actually way more efficient, uh, than, than shutting down a site on server level, because Honestly, every 12 year old has a VPN nowadays and can surpass that shutdown within two seconds. And I'm just, you know, asking myself like, how, like, what are these politicians playing at? Like, it's, it's clearly the, the, the way they're going. It's clearly doesn't make any sense, neither technologically nor like in a human level, actually, like and to protect the children or, or minors. So I'm like, what is happening? This is clearly a very conservative policy trying to harm the porn industry and not to protect anyone. It's interesting. The point that you brought up about the parental controls is actually really interesting because I was realizing the other day, um, you know, I have a one and a half year old, so I don't need to worry about uh, her surfing the internet anytime soon. But like the, I realized that I myself as somebody who works in the adult industry and who's a parent, like I actually don't really know exactly what parental controls I could use to prevent my children from accessing porn. And I realized like, that is not something that anybody I think knows. Like, I think probably most parents don't even know that that exists, that that's possible and that they have access to these controls to monitor what their children are watching. So like, why are we not educating people on that? Like that is a, a simple, easy solution that everybody adheres to. Um, like there should be some kind of PSA about like, hey, don't want your children accessing porn. Like, here are these programs that you can use to prevent that. Like, but there's no conversation about that. Which, like, why not? Because because <laughs> it's parents, all about like just trying to shut it down. Exactly, because people are so scared about even like talking, thinking about porn and and their children. Right? They don't even want to. They wouldn't want to hear about it. Um, like, or my, or basically, our politicians don't want to talk about it and they're just yeah you know they just want somehow the problem be gone without dealing with it right and that's a problem because that's not gonna happen and yeah it's it, i guess you're saying like we need to be educating everyone about this and we need to be also educating generally adults and children's like to talk more openly about pornography without feeling ashamed without you know, having all of these negative feelings are definitely going to have a negative impact in everyone's sexuality because shame never did good for anyone, I think, you know, in this realm. <laughs> yeah. And you're, and you're so right because lack of sexual education specifically here in the U S is, is a huge problem. And so you're dealing with parents who also didn't have really sex education themselves. Right. So, so they don't have it. Their children aren't getting it. And I think, um, almost every parent that I know who has a child of an age that probably is watching porn or could at least be doing so is like, Oh no, 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 no. They're too young. They're not watching it yet. I'm like, 
you, you sure about that? Like, because I think, you know, as parents, you think that you know your kids so well, but I think that there's comes a point in your, t- your life where most parents recognize that like, maybe they don't know their kid as well as they, right. they thought they did. And so also even, even if you're, that too. yeah. And even if your children are not interested in watching porn, which, you know, fair enough, there might be confronted with uh, other children showing them something, yeah, which is something totally. that happens, it just happens very often. And you, you, I think every parent wants their child to be equipped to deal with that situation so that they're not left alone with whatever they're seeing. And also in ideally that they also feel, um, you know, the confidence to come up to you and ask you about it. So, you know, and they don't mm-hmm. feel like they did something wrong or, you know, again, all of these horrible feelings that make you feel bad about sex, your sexuality. So I think, you know, it should be in the best of everyone's interest to, um, for everyone to be equipped to have that conversation. So for parents to start that conversation as soon, you know, the sooner the better, I'd say. Uh, but, you know, latest, the moment that even if your child is not actually pers- like searching for it, the moment they get confronted with it. And that's just, that's just going to happen. It's not if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen, you know? Yeah, that's that's so often the case. So I, I just have another question about um, this the way that Germany is trying to control people accessing porn. So you're saying that like in order for somebody to access, so in order for a, a a platform, an adult platform that exists in, in Germany, um, to be able to exist on the internet, people have to provide their identification, their IDs and all that information to access it. Does that, what, because generally one, considers like credit cards age verification right if you want to join a website you can't get a credit card before the age of 18 so if you have a credit card to join like one assumes you're 18 and then obviously you have to give your name and then your credit card number and and then it's verified by the bank so Mm -hmm. how does how does that work like can people just sign on to a website like one normally would with a credit card and that's considered identification or is it on top of that they have to submit their ID number and all of these other things that are normally not asked when you're signing up for an adult site with a credit card. Brace yourself because this one gets funnier. Uh, no, the credit card is not enough. And here's the logic behind it. Because a minor could get a credit card and use it from like a minor their parents. also get their parents' ID and use it. Well, no, because if you actually have to do like this face check, right? And oh, this, you have to do a face scan. No, no, for real. This is This is... It's, oh. it's, a, it's Kafkaesque, literally Kafkaesque, oh. <laughs> I, I assure you. Yeah. It's, it's, un, it's unreasonable, the whole, the whole thing. It's like, I, I'm laughing, but I, I want to cry, really, because it's, it's really that absurd, you know? <laughs> so you have to do like a fit, wow. You have That's, to do, yeah. I mean, people are distrustful of that in general, whether or not it applies to porn, because essentially like they're documenting and reading like the, the str- I mean, look, like I have it, I have face ID on my fucking phone. So clearly like I've given in to the man, but you know, there's a lot of people who are uncomfortable with that, yeah. that kind of thing. And understandably so. Yeah. And so then having to do that in order to access porn, which is also already something that's so stigmatized. Most people are super ashamed to admit that they watch or engage in like, I mean, they, these are just barriers that are gonna, have you, have you noticed like a significant um, change in the economy of porn in Germany because of this? Okay, here comes another fun fact. So this has been the whole time like this. Like, this is not news. They've been now um, acting on it and going after, um, you know, going after these big platforms, but this is the way that it's been since the internet started, whatever, like, since always. That's why, Mm -hmm. you know, no company, um, again, distributes from Germany. That's just the way it is. And nobody dares to say because everyone is scared uh, the, the, that, you know, next day, next thing you know, like I'm scared, next thing I know, I'm going to have a, a letter from the German government being like, you are going to jail, <laughs> you know? Uh, and this, it sounds so, in, I know it sounds really insane because um, it feels like how could this happen in a, you know, in a country like Germany? Uh, but this is the reality of this industry. It's really, we're so, we, it, it's the conversation is so overdue um that it's really a scandal mm-hmm. wow all right well let's talk about um a happier subject let's Yay. talk about uh <laughs> hard work 
your gangbang project. Gangbangs are always just a, a happy-go-lucky topic. It's my favorite. People love talking about gangbangs. So let's just let's just transition away from politics, politics, and let's go into gangbangs and uh, just lighten the mood here. So tell me about <laughs> uh, tell me about hard work. So hard work. Um, the idea came when I met my partner Rottweiler. Uh, and we met through a dating app, of course. Um, first, f- kind of like the first conversation that we were having, I was talking about the porn film festival uh, because I curate for it. And I was talking about films that I had seen. And he was telling me that he uh, was shooting gangbangs because he had shot a gang with his uh, previous partner. And the moment that he told me, I was like, oh my God, I, I need to be shooting gangbangs. Why am I not shooting gangbangs? And I think for me, it was kind of like, because I was telling you at the beginning, I come from this like old school feminist, um, you know, way of thought that it took me a little, it was a long process for me to like deconstruct all of the, my own barriers that I had when starting to do porn uh, uh, and reclaiming like my own kinky, you know, sexuality and making, you know, understanding for myself that everything is good and there, there's no sexual act that I should not be doing because it's not feminist or whatever. And suddenly, like, I hear, I'm hearing, like, gangbangs. And I think, like, gangbangs is kind of, like, considered the ultimate, like, symbol of, like, a woman being exploited by all of these men, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. I obviously love gangbangs and I've been having gangbangs fantasies since as far as I can remember. <laughs> um, and, of course, always feeling conflicted a little bit about those fantasies. Uh, and then suddenly I was like, no, this is this is the right time. I want to be doing, you know, the most, like, celebratory, orgiastic, uh, fun gangbangs uh, that I can imagine. And I want to make them, like, tailored to the fantasies of the person in the middle just to show, like, how much power and how much joy this person that is in the center of a gangbang uh, can have and enjoy, right? And I want to, like, yeah, just celebrate that. I love that. You know, I've shot three gangbangs in my life. And even though like logistically they can be kind of difficult because all those bodies moving together, like getting the penetration and stuff can be tough, but they have been some of the funnest shoots I've done. And I think it's because they were, uh, produced by the woman in the scene. So it was her idea. She hired the people in it she dictated what happened, um, you know, and she hired me. So it was definitely, uh, a scene that was curated and created by, by the woman. And so it's very difficult to say, you know, oh, gangbangs, all gangbangs are exploitative. If, you know, it's the woman putting it together, selecting the talent, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I know that those definitely, exist. And I know that there are, you know, some there, look, the porn industry is not for everybody. I've said that it's a million times. It's a, it's a place where, you know, honestly, it's interesting. All the interviews that I've had, it's a place where I've spoken to women who've healed past like sexual trauma through the agency and the control that they felt that they had doing porn scenes. Like they, it was a way that they could kind of like work through their issues in a place that they felt was safe and they had control and that kind of thing. And then it's exacerbated traumas, sexual traumas of other people, you know? So it's just kind of one of those things that it's like, it can be great for some people and it can not work for other people. It's just, it's, it's, it's a thing and it's not like bad or good. It's just anyways. Um, so, so I definitely know that there is, I know that there are women who have done gangbangs who who did it because they needed the money or they thought it was going to get them some award and they didn't really want to do it and they regretted it afterwards. And that's super, that's super regrettable. Um, but there's like a lot of women that who love it. They love the attention. They love being the center of attention. They love being like the celebrated person. And, um, you know, it's uh, like I said, for me, the, the, I shot one for Lisa Ann, Riley Reed and Joanna Angel. And I had so much fun. <laughs> nice. I mean, those sound like mm, really nice ones. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm an only child, right? So I'm a princess also as a sap. And it's like, it is the ultimate scenario. Like you, like everyone is there for you and everyone is pleasing you and you're the, you know, you're the queen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so I, I, I love the idea that, that you're doing this. So like how... So, so you're, so how, tell me like how you go about like 
booking a scene? Like what is, where does it start? Do you start with the girl and then you, you talk to her about what she wants and then you let that guide, um, how you produce it? Exactly. That's how we do it. So, uh, I want to say we've been mostly shooting with women as the centers. We've also shot with a non-binary, uh, person and performer, and we will be hopefully shooting soon also with men as centers. So we want to like, um, yeah, we want to try every, every possible constellation out, mm-hmm. but we mostly have been working mm-hmm. with women as the center performers. Uh, and the way we go about it is, yeah, we let them first fill in a very long list, um, it's kind of the list that you would uh, usually also fill in for like other BDSM parties or whatever. So basically just goes mm-hmm. from kissing to, you know, whatever verbal humiliation, quadruple anal, you, you, tell, you name it. Uh, and you write down what's your experience with it and how much would you like or not like to do it. So you can, you know, in, the, in this long list, you can already give like what's, a, what's your limits, which are no-no. Uh, and what is something that you'd love to try out. And we also leave some space for them to write if there are any concrete either locations or folks or scenarios or ideas that they would like to to do. So with that, Rod and I sit down and look at it and, 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 th- and start brainstorming and think we have different formats. So we feel like, okay, if there's someone, for example, that has not so much experience shooting, um, then we'd rather go for a smaller bank, right? So we have the, the smallest that we've shot so far is just three bangers so it's not so overwhelming um in terms of how many hands and dicks are around you <laughs> uh, yeah. and if it's someone that it's like you know i've already shot like whatever a million gang bangs but i want to do now this i don't know vampire dream then we're like okay let's let's get them all you know let's mm-hmm. focus on that thing um and then we have a conversation with with them and propose like our ideas and just basically go back and forth until we found uh the right concept the right idea the kind of location um, and, and then we propose also, I mean, we ask them if they have any cast wishes, so for their co-performers or otherwise we propose them a cast. And again, it's a bit of back and forth until we until we pin everything down, but they always have the last word. So we would never, mm-hmm. you know, push anything. We basically want to find something where the performer is like, fuck yes, I'm really looking forward to shooting this, you know, that's our yeah. aim. Yeah. Uh, and then we, and then we go on about putting together everything else, right? If it's like, so every, every film that we do it's like it's very unique like i mean we have formats that repeat uh but like in terms of like the cameras that we use the locations that we shoot on and so on and so forth like it really changes depending on what we come up and what we develop together Mm -hmm. cool well that sounds like fun it's a lot of fun it's a lot of work as you're saying and the logistics are not always as easy and actually we are gonna start shooting some just some I'm going to call them easy threesomes just because, you know, it's a lot of work of like having, yeah, all of the logistics of the gangbang and we just want to also try different things. But uh, yeah, but the gangmas are like out at our heart, at the heart of hard work and we will keep doing them. <laughs> yeah, no, gangbangs are definitely like kind of a logistical nightmare. I actually, it's funny, if if you guys go back, I've interviewed Lisa Ann a few times, but I think it was our f- our first interview. We talked about the logistical difficulties of a gangbang. I think it was before or after I shot her gangbang and it was just like, it was just funny thinking about all the things. Like one of the, one of the things that she brought up, which is so true. She was like parking. Where's everyone going to park? Am I at a location that has a lot of parking? Are they going to have to park on the street? Can they park on the street? Is there a permit issue with parking on the street? Like, you know, and then like, is there, how many showers are there at the location? Because everyone's going to want to take a shower afterwards. Um, Do we have enough towels for everybody? Like, do we have enough food, snacks? Do the guys like each other? Cause that's like a big part of a gangbang. The guy more so than like the girls liking the guys, the guys have to like each other and the guys yeah. have to be able to communicate in a way that moves the scene along. And Super uh, a lot of times if you see gangbangs, at least over here in America, a lot of times it's the same guys because like, I don't know, they just know how to work together and they've like got a system. So, uh, but yeah, the logistics is, is so above and beyond what people would, really think about absolutely i think it's so important what you're saying like the dynamic within the whole group needs to work you know like it's it's hard enough to find like you know two two, three four people uh to connect you know have a good chemistry on set and 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 and, and perform well together but yeah orchestrating this like more and more people it gets it gets tricky right and we shoot both bisexual and heterosexual gangbangs so sometimes the guys are bisexual and also get a lot like do stuff together um or, or not. And like navigating that, that's something that has taken us some learning to, um, you know, to understand like what, 
yeah, just how to create a space where everyone feels good, right? Because we want, obviously, everyone having mm -hmm. a good time uh, and, and creating and holding space for everyone. Uh, it's it's tough. Like, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not a, not an easy one. But I love the challenge yeah. as well. And, you've, <laughs> and you have to especially make sure that the guys feel good, not just because, you know, you're an ethical filmmaker and you want to make sure everybody's happy. But if the guy doesn't feel good, you might have performance problems. So like you have to think about that too. So it's just, uh, yeah, it's just, it's really kind of funny and interesting when you get down into the weeds. Let's see, we have like, I have to say we have a group of like really, really super amazing male performers that I love above everything. And they, I didn't know, just, I just trust them blindly. And, uh, yeah, it's just so hard to find, uh, to work with other people because I just, yeah, I just love working with them. Right. But as you were mm -hmm. saying, like it's, so it's not, yeah, it's, there's a reason why, um, yeah, what you see the same folks all the time because they're just great, you know? Um, uh, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The guys are so important to carry the scene. I definitely have my favorites. Like I know if I've got like, you know, for example, if I've got like Isaiah Maxwell on a set, like I know it's going to be a good scene, even if like the girl is new or inexperienced, like I know that like Isaiah is going to take care of her and he's going to make the scene look good. And so it's, um, yeah, like it's uh, the, the guys like, you know, just want to take my hats off to the male performers because they're so integral to a good scene. And I feel like sometimes they don't get enough uh, credit for like how important they are to us. Yeah, a hundred percent. So I, I'll sign that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Paulita. This was really cool. I'm so glad that we finally got to connect. Same. Thank you so much. It was so much fun. <laughs> Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media or your websites? Just go ahead and plug, plug all your links. Cool. Yeah. A little shout out to myself. So I have a website, which is paulitapapel.com and I'm on social on Instagram and Twitter at Paulita Papel. And you can, uh, find the documentary porn on lastery.com and the gangbangs on hardwork.com. And that's work W E R K. Thanks. I want to just, just point that out for my English for my English people because they'll they'll put in W O R K and they will not find the right website. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna make a mental note to self to actually pronounce it differently or note that. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. Don't forget, I am on TikTok as well, where I post uh, little short clips from my podcasts. That's uh, Holly Randall Unfiltered on TikTok. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and get access to bonus content, including live streams of my in-person interviews as they happen, or early releases, bonus Q and A's, access to um, some of my fine art photography, Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for being here and I will see you all next week. <laughs>